Good morning, church family. Grace and peace to you in the love of Jesus Christ. Welcome to FCC Worship this Palm Sunday morning. Uh, a little, one little announcement right away. Uh, as you can see, the screens aren't on. Uh, we're having some uh, technical difficulties. Use that traditional uh, phrase, right? <laughs> uh, we're, we're having some internet connection issues, so we're not able to live stream this morning. And that also affects our projection of the slides. But if you haven't already done so, we're gonna, so we're gonna be low tech today, which is okay, that's totally cool, right? Um, so I greet you all here, and we greet those who are intending to connect with us this morning, but aren't able to. We greet everyone with the peace of Christ. And if you haven't already done it, I invite you to check in. If you have a data plan and don't need to connect to our internet this morning, I'll let people know why being a part of FCC is important to you, why being a part of this church family is beneficial to you in your life. Uh, just a, a, a couple of announcements. As you can see, the yellow ropes are no longer here <laughs> in the sanctuary. Uh, they just kept falling off or getting um, taken off during the service. So we're, we'll continue to take our precautions with wearing masks, of course, and using, in, doing our own social distancing. Just be mindful of where you are and use the balcony, of course. Hey, everyone up there. <laughs> use the balcony up there if you're able to do so, so that we can seat ourselves a safe distance. Um, please check uh, the weekly e-blast and Facebook and the website for upcoming activities and events. We do have a, a special announcement that uh, Wendy Breitmeyer wants to make, so you can come forward to do that now, Wendy. <laughs> Just push the little yellow button on there. Go ahead and push the yellow button on there, Wendy. There's, it's on uh, pause right now. Push the little button. It's, it's, it's okay. You might be allowed to.
Thank you so much, guys, for inviting us to celebrate with you. So happy birthday. Uh, so please, like I said before, please check the weekly e-blast as that comes out each week, our Facebook page, our website, just for what's going on in our community. Now, uh, let's go ahead and um, do our liturgy of the palm. So get out our, let's get out our palm branches, right? I invite you to rise as you are able. If you don't have a palm branch, raise your hand and do this type of thing. Maybe someone can get one to you. All right. So uh, we're not able to uh, join you know, with those uh, online. For, those, for the people online, I was going to have them use their actual palm, <laughs> the palm of their hand to, to do this, which is what we did last year for, for Palm Sunday, right? So what I need all of you to do throughout the service today, not just here at the beginning, but throughout the whole service, is anytime you hear me say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, you say, Hosanna in the highest. So let's try that now. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Awesome, awesome. So let's take our palms and we gather together in this place, raising our branches of joy and joining all who wish to see Jesus eager for a healing touch or blessing received. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We gather, raising our branches of hope, and joining all who wish to hear Jesus, longing for a message of welcome and acceptance. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We gather, raising our branches of mystery and wondering if we're able to walk with Jesus through the week ahead in the face of pain and despair. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And we gather, waving our branches of prayer and walking toward the cross, knowing that it isn't the end of the story. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, friends, remain standing as you're able for our gathering Him. This is the day that the Lord has made.
This morning's gathering prayer, come, Holy One, come through the streets, come into the house, come to find a space beside us at the table. Speak to us with wisdom greater than ours, with love deeper than ours, with change wider than ours. Fill us with your spirit so that we are lovingly guided into greater avenues for growth. Through Christ's peace we pray. Amen. Yes, please be seated. And at this time, I want to invite all my younger friends to come forward for our kids' message. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's right. Go ahead and find a, an orange. Oh, yeah, you guys picked ones right up front. Good for you. Oh, Johnny, come on up, buddy. There we go. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good? Thumbs up good? Good? All right. Awesome. Me too. Today, I wanted to ask you a question about being helpful. Do you guys help out your parents or grandparents or friends? Or who? Do you guys help out? Who do you help out? You help out your grandfather. How do you help him out? By giving him a Band-Aid. That's very helpful. <laughs> that's very helpful. They're laughing because they, they know. They, they know what that's like. They do. Anyone else? Did you, guys, you guys help out around the house? Do you help mom and dad at all? Do you clean up? Your room sometimes? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you, when you do what they ask you to do, that's helping them out a lot. You guys do that sometimes? Yeah. Awesome. And why do we help out? Does anyone know why we help out? Is it just because we're told to? Sometimes. Sometimes we help out because we're told that we need to help out, right? But we also help out because it's the right thing to do, because it's nice. It's nice to help people, right? Yeah, that reminds me of our story today, because our story today, in it, a lot of people help Jesus. Yeah, we usually think of Jesus as the one who does all the helping, right? Well, sometimes people help Jesus out too. You guys remember the story at all about Jesus riding a donkey into Jerusalem? People put all their coats and their cloaks and their branches down on the road so that you know, they could cheer him on. Well, those people, they were helping Jesus out by cheering him on. He, before they made that, that journey, Jesus told his disciples to go into a little town and to get a donkey for him to ride on. So they were helping him out. And then the person's donkey, who it was, who let Jesus borrow it, he was helping out as well. Right? So lots of people were helping Jesus out. Now, do you guys think that we can help Jesus out today? Yeah? you think so? I do too. I think we can for sure. What are some ways that you guys can think of to help Jesus out today? Can you think of any ways? When we help other people, are we helping Jesus? Yes, that's right. When we help other people, we're helping Jesus. Because Jesus wants to help people, right? When we tell the truth, when we you know, stand up for what's right, when we help other people, when we're doing those things, we're living like Jesus. And when we do that, we're helping him out. And that's the good news for today, guys. All right, so let's do, let's do a repeat after me prayer, okay? So let's, 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 let's get our prayer stance on. Remember how, we learned, remember how we learned the pretzel thing like this? Remember that? You want, should we pray like that today? Should we? Okay, let's do that. Let's pray this way. This, is, this was... A pretzel prayer we learned last month in a family Sunday school, right? Because this was how kids used to pray a long time ago, and that's where the shape of the pretzel came from, right? So let's go ahead and do a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who invites us to help him so good things can happen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yay, God! All right, guys. You can go sit down. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> 
friends, this is the time in our service when I invite us to give of our tithes and offerings today or this week as a reminder. Um, for those people who are, you know, they're not live streaming today, but who aren't here today, they can always uh, send their gifts in. To, for those of you here today, please put your gift in the offering plate before you leave on the way out. Uh, may the good that God has given us, may we use that and give it forth for a common blessing for all. Thanks be to God. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. All right, keeping you on your toes, right? Please uh, join with me silently while I affirm a dedication for today's offering. God bless these gifts, the givers, and the receivers, so that the world may know your love and life even more fully. In the presence of Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's scripture reading is Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, listen, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say... The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany, 
with the Twelve. Here ends today's reading. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, why don't we go ahead and take this to God in prayer? Won't you join me? Father, Mother, God, we give thanks for your presence. We give thanks for our faith and for our church and all the different ways that we have experienced the support of church this past year. We pray for our congregation and all congregations of all faiths as they begin considering reopening. Whenever we each decide to return, May we come together and continue to join together and gather with confidence and strength, ready to continue our worship and our ministry into the future. We give thanks for the leaders in our church who have stepped up to help out in these tougher moments. We're grateful for the increase in vaccines available. And God, we trust in your guidance opening the way for continued freedom and flexibility in your divine order. God of grace, we pray for those struggling in pain, in anxiety or depression. And God, we pray for those dealing with hopelessness. Pour out your love into their lives and give them peace in their suffering. Give them the encouragement and comfort they need to take the next steps forward. God, we pray for your whole world. We hold in prayer all those who are affected by yet more mass shootings this past week in Boulder and some here in Chicago and around the country. Give those who are grieving your strength and your comfort and may your spirit of truth work within all people and places in these times of need. Help us to do our part, God, in creating a world that works for all. To stand in solidarity with those, too, who are working for healing and reconciliation. And so, God, we take our joys and our concerns this morning. And, God, we picture in our minds the face or the faces of those who we hold in prayer, whether we've mentioned their names aloud 
or whether they remain in our hearts, God. And we quietly speak forth their names right now into this prayer consciousness. Qua and Juan the Mark and Diana the Emma and Aaron. God, we trust in your spirit opening new doors of growth and of freedom and healing. We pray all this in the name of Jesus the Christ, God, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Won't you pray with me? <clears throat> Living God, may the words of my mouth and the reflections of our hearts be attuned to your love and wisdom this morning. In the peace of Christ, amen. So, retired Lutheran pastor Edwin Peterman has said, the world has a history of denouncing and killing messiahs who don't deliver what the world wants because the world doesn't want a God who is anything other than what the world wants. The world wants a lapdog God that can domesticate and control, who indulges and blesses the ego and selfishness of the world. Jesus was staying in the town of Bethany before entering Jerusalem, <clears throat> and he sent disciples to the nearby town of Bethphage to get, you know, a donkey and a colt. Um, and I was going to uh, show you some awesome sketches of just what that journey would have looked like from, from Bethany to, you know, through Bethphage and the Mount of Olives and all of that into Jerusalem. Um, it was about two-mile journey, maybe a little bit more. It was pretty rocky and hilly. But Jesus, as he was entering this particular gate, which was called the Golden Gate, it was, it was sort of in the northeast portion of the Temple Mount, so it was a really important gate that was sort of thought about in people's minds. So like the Messiah was supposed to enter right there. And that was part of why there was so much celebration, so much cheering. It brought into people's minds something from the prophet Zechariah. This was planned. Jesus was planning this. And it was intentionally meant to make people think of the words of Zechariah. In Zechariah and in Jewish tradition, the, the coming Messiah was to enter through, you know, past the Mount of Olives, through the, the Golden Gate, like Jesus did. And Zechariah says that the Messiah would enter, quote, sitting on a donkey and the foal of a donkey. Sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, this is exactly what Jesus was doing. It wasn't an accident that Jesus entered Jerusalem in this way. It would have immediately brought to people's minds the, these images, these words. People of Jerusalem longed for a savior. They were on the lookout 
for something like this. They wanted someone to drive out or destroy the Romans. <laughs> That's really what they were looking for because of how much oppression was going on. They wanted, in their minds, a military conqueror who's going to lead them to victory. Yet what they got was a Messiah who valued justice and compassion as the way to peace rather than victory and violence. One who insisted that they love their enemies, that they put down their swords, that they seek a new way, a new path. Jesus wasn't the Messiah they were looking for at all. And so they turned on him. It didn't take too long. He's an inconvenient Messiah because even though the crowds had their way, even though his nonviolence was met with violence, even though the powers that be crucified him, even then, Jesus continued to love and forgive his torturers. That's an inconvenient Messiah. A number of years ago in the UCC, in just congregational churches in general, Palm Sunday used to be called just Palm Sunday. <laughs> but nowadays, it's, it's sort of called Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday too. And when I ask fellow clergy about this who've been around a while in congregational circles, they think it was, it was because people just weren't showing up for Holy Week services. <laughs> People weren't showing up for Monday, Thursday, Good Friday services, so they just pushed it all to, <laughs> up to Palm Sunday, so at least that stuff is heard before Easter. They were going from the triumphant Hosanna of today, of, of Palm Sunday, and straight to the He is risen of Easter without the whole crucify him of Good Friday, you see. And hey, I get it, you know, friends, I get it. For people who have that impulse, I totally can relate to that, to that impulse. Who doesn't want to just go from glory to glory and just skip all of that messy, embarrassing death and dying stuff in the middle? That middle stuff's uncomfortable. That middle stuff, we don't really want to think about it too much. Stuff like how Jesus ate his last meal with the people he loved most, who ended up betraying him, who ended up abandoning and denying him. Stuff like the crowd beating and taunting him. Stuff like the crown of thorns and the, and the heavy cross of judgment and humiliation. That's the kind of stuff we want to just rush, rush past real quick, you know. So we just go from the triumphal palms of Palm Sunday to the lilies of Easter, it would be great. We don't have to deal with all that embarrassing stuff. So we don't have to feel uh, bad for Jesus or bad about ourselves. And that's the issue with the cross. As I was reflecting on it this past week, that's really the issue that, that I've been finding, you know. It feels either senseless or condemning, often both. Crucifixion had a long history in the ancient Near Eastern world. I mean, we have court records and artwork depicting crucifixion as early as the 7th century BCE, like what used to be called BC, right? With the Assyrian Empire, then with Alexander the Great. I mean, we have really good evidence that he crucified some 2,000 captives after the siege of Tyre. And so the Romans simply adopted the practice for themselves. Actually, I would even venture to say that, that they perfected it. Crucifixion was a demonstrative act. It was, a, it was an execution. It was a capital punishment reserved for traitors, for you know, violent criminals, rebellious criminals, and uprisings, peasant uprisings, people coming together trying to revolt against Rome. You crucify them. That's what you do if you're Rome. I mean, Rome didn't care. You know, they, a couple hundred over here, a couple thousand over there, they didn't care. They would line the roads like mile markers with people dying on crosses. It was like a billboard advertisement for them. That's how they saw it in their mind. And it actually came out of the defense fund. This was a way to defend the empire. Don't do what this person on the cross did. Otherwise, you might find yourself in similar circumstances. So it was pretty effective in that way. Death by crucifixion was not something that people wanted to endure. 
it was slow, it was excruciating, it was humiliating. That was even the worst part of it all. No proper burial, no funeral rites, no dignity. The whole purpose really was to reduce you to a non-person. That was the idea. It was designed to be that way. It was to prevent resistance to the empire, to Rome. So the most historically verifiable fact that we know about Jesus' life is this event, is the crucifixion. So the cross is there, even if there are some of us who would like to just sort of ignore it. But it's important that we wrestle with it this week. There's a whole strain of theological thinking in Christianity which teaches that the cross is all about how God had to send you know, his son, the only one, to suffer and die a horrible death because I'm so bad. And so are you all, right? If someone, you know, someone has to pay for my badness, so being a Christian means feeling bad enough about all of this that you would then try a lot harder to not be so bad to be good or better. Now, you know, from my viewpoint as a pastor, as a theologian, I'm just not sure which is worse about this kind of theology. You know, it it turns God into being like, I don't know, a divine child abuser or, you know, a loan shark demanding his pound of flesh. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't see the cross that way, and I certainly don't experience God that way. You know, I think this kind of theology happens when we think that the cross is all about us. That it's all about us and not about God. About who God is in God's very identity and nature as love itself. When we think the cross is just about us, the view of God that gets put out there is a God sort of standing up in heaven Arms crossed like this, right? Maybe wagging the finger, shaking the head, tut-tutting, that kind of thing. Looking down and judging and shaming. And judging us by punishing Jesus. It's so grounded in guilt. It's so grounded in fear and shame. But the thing is, friends, when it comes to Holy Week, God isn't standing above the cross. God is hanging on the cross. The good news is that there's a way to experience the nature of God, and it's to look at humanity and divinity through the very life of Jesus. Jesus is God's self-revelation for us. It's like Jesus' life is God saying, Look, this is how I, this is what I look like. This is what I look like as I show up in a human life. This is how I want to be known. Listen to Jesus. Watch him. Follow him so you can really know what I'm like. We best experience who God is and how God chose to reveal God's self in a humble peasant cradle and on a Roman cross. The cross isn't a, a, some kind of steely-eyed legal transaction that is made to pay our debt. On the cross, we witness God. The cross reveals something important about who God is and what God is all about. It shows us that God's present in every single part of our lives, not just in the hunky-dory stuff, not just when it's sunshine and rainbows. God is with us even when we're bearing the crosses of our lives, even when we're going through the struggle of our lives. God's with us. God isn't a a changeless, unfeeling, uninvested God. The cross proclaims that God is with us each step of the way, even at the worst of times. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem that we recognize and lift up today, his entrance on a humble donkey, not a warrior horse, by the way, could have, chose something different. That demonstrates the power of self-giving, self-sacrificial love, which isn't what we're used to, is it? (laughs) It turns our world upside down 
to experience the awe of that kind of love. So on this Palm Sunday, we're invited to follow in that way of Jesus and to live in the world in a completely new kind of way, colored by God's boundless embrace of humanity, which we most starkly see on the cross. Because from the cross, the pronouncement is clear. It is love. It is forgiveness. It is embrace. From the cross, God loves even the betrayer and the hater and the God rejecter in all of humanity. Even though the suffering and death of Jesus isn't about us, it's definitely for us. God is so for us that there is no place that God won't go to be with us even on those crosses. So let's not skip the cross, because even though it's uncomfortable, because we enter this week in the company of a self-emptying God, a God that embraces us with a relentless love, a God who would even enter the grave in the stench of death itself, to say to us, even here, even here, I am with you. Welcome to Holy Week. Let us pray. God of love, thank you for being present in our lives, in our struggles, and in Jesus on the cross. Thank you for being present as strength and comfort in all of the pain and suffering that we go through. May your self-emptying spirit move in and through all of these shadows of this week to bring us the hope of new life that we know in you. In the name of your presence beyond us and among us and within us, we pray. Amen. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Indeed, may the love and the justice of God be with us this holy week as we walk this path towards Easter. So let's go forth today and this week knowing that God's with us each and every step of the journey. And so it is. Amen.
Let us go forth now as the body of Christ to share the peace of Christ. Grace and peace to you.